This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I want to tackle a bunch of subjects, a bunch of items that have come across my desk in one way or the other in the last couple of weeks. So think of this as my Twitter feed for the day. And I'm not a big poster on Twitter, but think of the person that you know, that you follow, that posts a million things on Twitter, typically interesting. And maybe you check them out. These are some really interesting topics that have come across my desk. First, out of the gate, and for those of you that are not American football fans, you will still be able to take something away from this, but we must salute Nick Saban winning his sixth national championship. Amazing. Five at Alabama, five in the last nine years. Nick Saban is fond of saying he has a process You already know I love that. He is the only college football coach I think that I quoted in my newest version of Trend Following. But he has this process. And he sticks with this process. And he does the same damn process day after day, year after year. Now, I've not read any books on Nick Saban. I watch from afar. I went to school not too far away to where he teaches in Alabama. I went to school in North Florida for grad school at Florida State. So I have some familiarity with what goes on at big powerhouse schools in the South when it comes to college football. I got to see it up close and personal. I watched a lot more than I ever thought I would. I don't watch as much today, but I have a very good feel for it. Nick Saban wins because of his process. So what is his process? He wants the biggest strongest, fastest men that he can possibly find primarily on his defensive line because that is the dividing line across college football, period. And he has that year after year, year after year, year after year. Now, some people might argue, oh, no, that's not true. Look, come on. Have you been to the South? Do you know how this works? Saban has four classes of football players, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Three or four, five, six of those guys will play professionally every freaking year. They go there because they know they will play professionally. They know that Saban has this system that prepares them for the pros. But Saban's selfish, rightfully so. His system of getting these great defensive linemen, that's the dividing line because there's only so many cat quick, 300 pound guys, 6'2 to 6'4, that can run a sub 540. And Saban typically has the best ones. So you could have the greatest quarterback in college football, you could have the greatest running back. But if you have potentially future first-round NFL draft picks on your defensive line, you're going to win national championships. That's Saban's process. Now, don't get me wrong. Saban has fantastic other players on his team, and they play professionally as well. But that defensive line, those linebackers, that's where he makes his money. So I'm a big fan of Nick Saban, a big fan of success. I root for success. I love to see it. I love to see somebody that has a great process. Nick Saban has a great process. All of that said, I posted at halftime of the game most recently where he was down 13 to 0 at halftime. I posted on my Facebook. I said, "Why does the greatest college coach not recruit quarterbacks?" Now, that's kind of a funny statement since we all know how the game ended with a quarterback throwing a laser to win the game for Alabama, but it's a true statement. Alabama quarterbacks don't go on to play professionally and do anything. So does Nick Saban's process need an NFL caliber quarterback? Clearly not. Clearly not. So why does he not recruit those quarterbacks? Well, when you have the biggest, strongest, fastest guys on the lines, 
you control the ball. You control the clock. You beat the other guy up with sheer brute strength, athletic ability. You wear them down. That's his process. Now, if you're Nick Saban and you know that's your process to control the line of scrimmage, why in the hell do you want to have the five-star recruit for the next Brett Favre coming out of high school? That guy just wants to throw all day long. That goes against the Nick Saban process. Some people on my Facebook thought I was criticizing Nick Saban. Why does the greatest college coach not recruit quarterbacks? Some people said, oh my gosh, you're chastising this great coach. Why are you not fixating on his national championships? I'll guarantee you Nick Saban would love to have a conversation about why he picks the quarterbacks that he does. Why does he pick running quarterbacks? Why does he pick guys that are not five-star pocket passers? Because I'll guarantee you, even at the top, the absolute top of his field, Nick Saban does not go into the back room, drink a gallon of whiskey, and say to himself, I'm the greatest. Oh, maybe he does for a second, but what that guy clearly does, he studies, he tears things apart, and he's always looking at his process. Now, as a guy who has watched, as I mentioned, college football for a long time, there have been other teams that have had these great defensive lines. Miami in the 80s and 90s, Florida State, for sure. Those two teams are right there. And they did attempt to recruit quarterbacks. Florida State never had great success, but Miami won national championships with quarterbacks that went on to have long careers in the NFL. So it can be done both ways. There's always an option. There's always a different take, which leads me to, if you look at Nick Saban's last couple years, the games that he has lost, you might arguably say not having a great quarterback. Even though he's won five of nine national championships, he could have won all 10, perhaps, with quarterback play. Now, that's being a little greedy, but that's the name of the game. The name of the game is what was he failing on? He failed last year with Clemson. His quarterback in the semifinal game with Clemson this year did not do so great. So down 13 to nothing in the national championship game, Nick Saban says it's time to change the process. Let's throw a curveball. Let's put a guy in the game who throws the ball. And then we all know what happened. It's history. So back to my question that I posted on Facebook. Why does Nick Saban not recruit quarterbacks? Not recruit great NFL-type quarterbacks? It's a complicated issue because the man clearly wins national championships. And I think he likes his process, which has you know, made him legendary, perhaps the greatest college coach ever. He likes his process as it is and doesn't appear to want to change. And why should he? Now, if you're another coach at another school and you don't have access to those defensive linemen, you have to do something different. You can't just do the same damn thing Nick Saban does because you're not going to get the same players that Nick Saban does. Why do you think every college team out there wants to hire a Nick Saban assistant Hopefully it will rub off on their team and they will have similar success. But what I love about that story more than anything, digging into it, is the process. Analyzing the process and backtesting. Looking at if-then contingencies. Looking at if-then what could have happened, what are the possibilities. I mean, let's face it, this most recent national championship game, it was a coin flip. Saban could have lost. That's how close it was. This style of thinking is 100% correlated to great trading, to great investing, to being an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist. The same way to break issues down, to break play down, to break anything down. I mean, if you're not breaking it down, what the hell are you doing? Just sycophantic ass kissing? Oh, that guy's the greatest. No. Study why he's the greatest. Dig into it. Find out. Examine. I always talk about in this podcast 
going back and looking at Dunn Capital's month by month track record going back 40 plus years. If you're listening to me right now and you have not looked at the month by month track record of Dunn Capital going back to the mid 1970s, look at the performance every month. If you've not spent some time studying that, oh sure, you might have a nice life. You might make some great investments. But why the hell would you not want to backtest in your mind that type of performance? Why would you not want to dig in a little bit more and improve yourself by looking at what somebody else who's come before you has done? The good, the bad, and the ugly. In the case of Dunn Capital, it's mostly good. My second topic of this podcast episode is completely unrelated. At least as I begin to tell you about it, I think it's completely unrelated. Maybe my mind will wander in the middle of telling you this, and it will become related. A young guy, he writes me. He works at a institution. He works at an operation where some very famous trend-following traders, people that I know, come by. And so he's had a chance to meet them, and now he's been given the opportunity to go in and have a conversation, an interview. He thinks he might even get mentored by them. That'd be a fantastic opportunity for a young guy. And so he writes me. He says, are there any important questions that you've learned to be very valuable to yourself when interviewing or learning from people like fill-in-the-blank famous trader? Any input you may have will be forever appreciated. I wrote him back. And I mentioned, hey, have you read certain books of mine? Have you listened to the podcast of these guys that have actually appeared on my podcast? Have you listened to that? And then I said to him, you need to get some studying done before that first interview. Because he sounded a little unprepared. He sounded not exactly confident, a little unsure. So he's made the effort to land this interview, but now he's asking me, how should I handle it? He writes me back. He says, well, I'll look up that podcast that you're talking about. I'm thinking, oh, man, he's not already listened to that? Well, that's not being very prepared. How can he not have possibly listened already? He also said to me, when you say studying, do you mean about this particular person, about their company? Not sure what kind of studying you're referring to, he said to me. But then he came back to me and he said his biggest struggle so far is gaining confidence he did not have to tell me that. I could see that in his text messages. I wrote him back and I said, hey, look, if all the things that I've told you to do so far, reading, listening to these podcasts, maybe the meeting you're going to have is too early. And I said, look, these people you're meeting with are very prepared. You must realize that. He wrote me back and he said he's found a lot of the stuff. He's digesting it. And he said at this point, he feels like a high school baseball player meeting with Ted Williams to talk about batting. He then said to me, what kind of structure or goal do you think I should have for this meeting? Then he said, I believe having him on my side will shorten my learning curve. Okay, come on. We all know that. I mean, if you're going to meet with one of the most famous traders alive, one of the most successful guys alive... Of course he can shorten your learning curve. But don't wear that excitement on your arm. Yes, you might get hired. Maybe you won't get hired. Maybe you'll get some good information. Maybe you won't get some good information. But it's bad process to be talking about and worrying about whether or not he can help you. Of course he can help you. That's not the point. You have to be patient. Maybe you have to help him first. Maybe you need to give him something. Maybe he needs something. Maybe you can help him in a way. So he came back to me and he said, are there any pointers? He's asked me this question several different ways already. I'm giving him answers that he seems to have ignored. And then he tells me the exact date they're meeting and the time. I guess trying to tell me that he's panicking. Well, yes, I can see that he's panicking. 
In response to his pointers, I said, you don't ask your questions if you follow my pointers. He said, good point. Very nice. Appreciated that I gave him some advice. But it's a worthy example for all of us to think about, young or old. I can think back to the very first time that I had one of those moments. And it was with the CEO of Solomon Brothers. I've relayed this story before. I'll try and be as detailed as I can possibly be. Going back in memory to a long time ago, I think, 1994, I believe. Yes. I graduated Florida State with an MBA. And I went to the alumni office to see who worked on Wall Street. I found two guys. One was in the Lehman Brothers Municipal Bond Department. I did meet with him. He was very nice. He actually took me to a lunch in their corporate dining room at Lehman Brothers. I remember sitting literally next to Dick Fold. I can't remember if I met him or not, but it was that kind of a deal where you were sitting in the room, in the main room with the main players at Lehman Brothers. It was quite interesting. But the really interesting conversation, the one that changed my life for sure, or at least got me started going down the path, was meeting with a guy named Jim Massey. Now, if I have to go back in time before that, it was Michael Lewis's book, Liar's Poker, that really, really said to me, I believe I knew about Liar's Poker before I knew the turtle experiment, I'm pretty sure. But it was the same point, right? Michael Lewis was trained. The turtles were trained. So the idea was, hey, anybody can do this if you get in the door. So with that Liar's Poker knowledge in hand, the Florida State Alumni Office in hand, finding the one guy from Lehman Brothers, I then find Jim Massey, the then recently retired CEO of Solomon Brothers. Literally, that was, that was it. This was not like going to Harvard or Wharton. The alumni was just not extensive in a Southern school. But Massey agreed to meet with me. I took the train up from Washington, D.C., he had a small office right inside the then train station right there at Greenwich, Connecticut. We walked to a small cafe. He was eating a salad for 45 minutes, head down. I was talking away like a lunatic. I don't know what I said. I probably said some of the same stupid stuff that the guy that just wrote me on Facebook said. But at some point in time in that conversation, I realized, man, this is going way downhill. This guy's never going to talk to me again. Whatever I'm saying is worthless to him. Whatever I'm saying is pointless to him. He clearly thinks I'm an idiot. You know, you could read all these things, right? I could see all this. I knew this was happening. And I said to him, while he had head down eating salad, Mr. Massey, have I said anything today where you thought I was full of shit? Now, he's a complete stranger. He is the then-retired CEO of Solomon Brothers, easily one of the most recently powerful 100 men on Wall Street, for sure, 100%. It was a great response. He stopped eating. He looked up at me, looked at me straight in the eyes, and he said, yes, you said you wanted to be the best. You don't want to be the best. You just want to win. Now let's go talk. I never ended up working with Solomon Brothers, but that conversation changed me. Because what it was, for the first time in my life, it was behind the scenes with a super achiever. Behind the scenes with somebody at the top of the heap. Behind the scenes with one of the CEOs of the then six investment banks in the U.S., snap of the fingers. You're changed. You're different. Now, that did not mean I would walk around cursing in front of everybody. But I assessed the situation, assessed him, and realized I better say what I'm really feeling. I better put my ass on the line right now in front of this man if I want to get anything. If I want to get anything. Because I'm going to get nothing. He doesn't like what I'm saying so far. So I better get real. I better go hat in hand. I better show him that I've got some moxie. So when that young guy writes me and he asks me those questions all those years after my first experience, 
he's going the wrong way. He might get a job. He might get hired. But you're going to have a hard time being the next man if that's how you're thinking. Because he's not prepared to go meet with people who've appeared on my podcast and you've not yet listened to them on my podcast and you're in your 20s. What, did people in their 20s forget how to use fucking Google? What the hell's going on? Again. He was very complimentary to me. He was very nice in his text. I'm not picking on him too hard. I'm picking on his process. There we go. Right back to Nick Saban. This guy's process, bad. Now, he's not supposed to have the Nick Saban process as a 20-something guy, but you got to have your process. You've got to have some kind of process for navigating. And if you're going to go meet with one of the most famous and accomplished traders of the last 30, 40 years, you sure as hell better be prepared. If you're not prepared, okay, flip the coin. Maybe something good happens. Maybe something bad happens. Maybe nothing happens. But why not put the odds on your side? My third tangent today. Unrelated. At least I think they're unrelated. James Damore, he wrote this interesting write-up about the lay of the landscape inside Google. He was fired. Now he has filed a massive lawsuit. I think 140 page PDF that you can easily find online. It's extremely interesting reading. In that lawsuit, Damore talks about an employee of Google who sexually identifies as a yellow scaled wingless dragon kin. And this person once gave an internal company presentation about living as a plural being. I'm just an average guy. I got to tell you, I don't know what the hell a plural being is, but apparently plural beings could be something like a guy, let's say a grown male, who has one identity as the grown male, another identity as a little girl, and a third identity as a dragon. I don't remember the exact definition of a dragon kin. I looked it up. It's something to do with Dungeons and Dragons, I believe. But let's just stick with the dragons. So we have a grown male who is a grown male in one identity. He's a dragon in another identity, and he's a little girl in another identity. The key thing when you meet one of these people is that you have to talk to them in such a way where you do not offend one of their headmates. So if you have three of these things in your head, the dragon, the little girl, and the grown male, they would be considered headmate, M-A-T-E. Yes, this is a new term for me. I've never heard of this term until now, but now I know it. So you have to be careful not to offend people with multiple headmates. Now, I'm not going to go the typical direction you might expect me to go because it's a little too easy to rip the hell out of that. I think we can all do that on our own. I think what's interesting about what goes on at Google or perhaps many other corporations or many other large universities when it comes to the identity movements out there, and these identity movements are getting quite complicated, obviously, if you have to keep track of headmates and one person. So now if you know Bob down walking down the street, Bob might have 163 identities or headmates, and you have to be careful the way you talk to him, because one of those 163 headmates could be offended, and one of the 163 headmates might not be offended, but you could see there could be a lot of conflict here. Okay, that's all just, it is what it is. But how do we get there? How do we get to the point where that exists? We get to that point because we are in a winner-take-all society. It's a winner-take-all society in the sense that the money is used to invent realities. And I would argue that the money being used to create these realities, the realities that are being created, perhaps they're some of the least logical realities in the history of mankind. Now, we can go back to ancient Egypt, and it looks like they were having a grand old time inventing their reality. I mean, it's all on the walls and the hieroglyphics. I mean, we can see what they were doing. But in the modern age, where you have so much money concentrated in the hands of a few, we really can't expect those few to all be, quote, normal. 
and they're clearly not. Where am I leading with this? You have to figure out for yourself what reality is, what's normal, what's ethical, what's moral. And you have to figure out a way to navigate. In 2018, that navigation is quite different. My nephews as teenagers will not navigate the same as myself. They will have many more roadblocks put in front of them. They will have to disguise their actions and their intentions and their motivations much more than in years past, decades past. Because when the biggest operations around are creating rules and realities that literally don't make sense, it doesn't necessarily make sense to fight, at least not on that front. Sun Tzu, art of war, right? Why would one walk into the hornet's nest of the biggest tech players with more money than God if they control a large extent of reality? You got to find a way around it. Not only do you have to find a way around it to just survive, you have to find a way around it to learn. Because I'll guarantee you, Jim Massey and my Solomon Brothers story, that guy was not going to entertain headmates. Warren Buffett is not going to entertain headmates. Only in very powerful new operations with lots of money could such worlds and such realities come into existence. I actually had somebody come on Facebook, a Facebook friend who has been on Facebook interacting on my site forever. He tried to justify this stuff. He talked about what the psych professors are teaching. It's tough, man. How does one get behind the curtain to see what's real? I feel so fortunate. Many, many times in my life, I've had a chance to get behind the curtain to see how something operates. You want to know how the government and the United States of America operates? Local, state, federal level? It ain't pretty. Forget the partisan stuff. It's deep state. And when I say deep state, I don't necessarily mean conspiratorial. I just mean the people that work for government, they work to protect their job, number one. And if you are a threat to their job, they will use every part of and power of the state to eliminate you. So again, back to Sun Tzu. What do you let people see when you need to move forward? If you don't have enough of an army on your side, pick your places, pick your battles. I don't have very good advice for people that want to be a part of large operations. Large operations are massive groupthink, massive sheep behavior. I don't necessarily even respect large operations. I don't respect the people that work for large operations. That doesn't mean I don't like you. doesn't mean I'm trying to criticize you. I just don't respect it. It's 2018. You can do anything, absolutely anything. And if you can do anything, why would you go to work every day saying yes, sir, to an asshole to achieve nothing except a fucking paycheck. And then if you add to it, to accept that paycheck, your reality is completely altered. And you might go 10, 20, 30 years of your life in some crazy dystopian mindset where you don't know up or down, left or right. And then wake up one day and go, my God, I've been brainwashed. I fell into the trap. The system ate me. And you don't want to have the system eat you. That's no fun. It's a hell of a lot more fun. Running fast, running loose, and being free. My fourth point I want to tackle today. Someone writes me. 
says he has been trading his system religiously for two months, his trend-following system, has had some success, some gradual success, moving his stops up to protect anything more than a 1% loss. But he recently had his stop get blown through, and he lost more than 1%. He was asking me, are there ways to avoid the flash crash? My response back, are you trading only one market? He kind of gave me an ambiguous answer because my answer was the way to avoid a flash crash is really simple. I mean, it's not really simple, but conceptually it's simple. You can't necessarily stop a flash crash. You can't do anything. It could possibly happen again. But the key, what I was asking him, one market alone, are you in one market alone? And he was. So he has no diversification. He's got all of his eggs in one basket. If he takes it on the chin, he takes it on the chin. He can't do anything about it. Diversification. Connected to that, at least connected in my mind, when I look at the great crypto move of the last year, I think it's fabulous. All these young people have figured out a way to bypass the system. Forget working for Goldman Sachs. You're not going to be Warren Buffett. Boom! Boom! Cryptocurrencies appear, and you now level the playing field. I think that's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Now, let's be honest. With hundreds and hundreds of cryptocurrencies out there, they're not all going to make it. We don't know which ones will survive, but we know there will probably be some survivors, but there's going to be a hell of a lot of losers. But I love the attitude of bypassing the system. But it gets back to my guy's question on diversification. He's in one market alone. The cryptocurrencies, don't try and convince yourself about some lack of correlation. I mean, come on. They're all related. They're all connected at the hip. When big moves happen on the upside, they're going to go together. When big moves happen on the downside, they're going to go together. Back to the guy that asked the question about the flash crash. How do you stop it? Diversification. Diversification does not mean having 20 cryptocurrencies. That's not diversification. Have you examined what the correlation between those cryptocurrencies are? Yes, we all know they're very high. My point is really simple, though. Don't think one market alone. Think diversification. The diversification will protect you if you get caught up in a flash crash. Mike, there's no guarantee it will protect me. You're right. There's no guarantee it will protect you. That's the best you got, though. You don't get more than that. You don't get a guarantee. There are no fucking guarantees. You want a guarantee? Buy a fucking toaster. Shout to Clint Eastwood on that line. I mean, in all seriousness, if you want a guarantee, get a toaster, get a microwave. Markets are not about guarantees. They're about diversification. The classic cliche, the free lunch, it's diversification. Live it, breathe it. Last but not least today, feedback from a listener to this podcast. Real straight shooter. He came at me with some praise, but it was very straightforward. Not, not any kind of ass-kissing praise. He said he had listened to a bunch of financial and investing podcasts and he found that the vast majority of them lacked edge. And I'll single out the two that he said had edge, Meb Faber's and mine. And I appreciate that compliment. It's nice. It's nice to hear. And he was very straightforward about what edge means, just letting personality shine through, perhaps not being so cautious. I think that's a great takeaway for all of us in 2018. I mentioned some of this controversial identity stuff coming from the Google lawsuit. I suspect many people do not want to comment on that because they either don't feel they can protect themselves or they feel like they could open themselves up to harm. And that's probably taking place across society at all levels and on all issues People are afraid. They're afraid to be real. 
They're afraid to tell you how it really works. They're afraid to let other people see behind the curtain on something they might know. And they're afraid to look behind the curtain. Because if Cobell tells me something, or if Meb Faber tells me something, and I don't like how it looks, that might change my life. That might force me to a new consciousness. I might have to adjust. And I like my little happy world. I like my little fake world. I don't want to have to change. Look, I'm not all that either. I constantly take in new information, new insights, new pieces of wisdom. This podcast changes me on a daily basis. But why not? Why not chase constant knowledge? Why not chase it until you die? And just saying the word die like that. I have a sneaky suspicion my listener that writes me, that's what he means by edge. Talking about something like, you might just die soon. You'd rather sooner die than you would to be authentic. Edge scares you. Behind the curtain scares you. Look at my young guy that I mentioned at the top of this podcast. He knows he's got the interview, but he's scared about what to say. I would advise don't take the interview. You're not ready. You're just not ready. So as we all jump in to tackle 2018, I think edge is a great word. Maybe we should all dare to apply more edge to our lives, more edge to our friends' and family's lives. Not to insult people, not to piss them off, but to get the edge out there, to get the reality out there. None of this headmate crap, this made-up nonsense In university psychology departments? No. Edge means getting real. And please, if this podcast ever ceases to become real, just drop me an email, please. And you can rip me to your heart's content because the moment I sound like that, it's all over. It's freaking all over. There's no more reason I should just jump ship at the moment. I sound like all edge is gone. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.